right. It is good to be here tonight. Good full house tonight for a Monday night for this conference. I think you want to be here, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, let's get, get to, uh, to the psalm book first, all right? Let's sing to our Lord. Let's all stand. Brother Andrew's going to lead us in our first two songs. We are going to jump right into this tonight, and I uh, hope you've come hopefully ready to be fed and so prayed up and ready to go. All right, Andrew, let's go ahead and sing to the Lord. Amen. Yeah, let's get started. All right, let's grab the blue hymnals in front of you and go to hymn number 170. Yes, amen. In the blue hymnal, hymn 170. Yes. Saved by the blood. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. tonight we'll go a few pages before and go to hymn number 164 heard a lot of great parts that last song beautiful hymn number 164 164 what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Oh 
singing tonight. Let's open in prayer, and uh, we are dealing with spiritual warfare tonight, and we're going to get right into it. I, I do appreciate all of the prayer that's gone into this meeting. I could sense that people have been praying for this conference, and so we thank the Lord for people that really understand the gravity of what this is and what we're dealing with, and I thank the Lord for a man of God uh, that is able to unpack some of this material and help us tonight and, and go across the country and help churches just like ours, and I thank the Lord for that. John Thorhill, if you would open us in prayer tonight, brother, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come to the throne of grace. If you would do that for us tonight. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just come before you. You're right here in this room. You're walking about. When your word is spoken, it's just a glorious thing. Yes. So just bless this time together, and no word will fall empty. Bless the speaker. Everybody listening, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 One name. Thank you, being seated. Uh, just. A couple of announcements here. Uh, as uh, you all probably know already, we're, this conference starts tonight and goes to Wednesday night. If you're watching online, we'll be live streaming this. This is not an excuse to get out of church, all right? But we will be live streaming this Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. Some people do have to work, and so you can watch it while you're working. Listen to it while you're, uh, if you have to, uh, stay away from the congregation. We're going to live stream it. I actually had a, a lady call me on the way in and say, is it live stream? Yes, it is. So just a note there, it starts each each evening, 630. Of course, tonight is the first one. Children's classes, nurseries available all through the kindergarten each night. And, uh, and so looking forward to um, what God has for us. Uh, SSBC is off to an incredible start. We had one save on Sunday and uh, eight more visitors, nine more visitors. Uh, so get some yard signs and take those out to your different communities and different neighborhoods and invite folks out to SSBC. We got two more weeks. And so be in prayer for that. Pray for the preaching of God's word, all the work that's going into this, that we'd have more salvations. And uh, we thank the Lord for one. We thank the Lord for the opportunity to preach the gospel. Thank the Lord for that. So get some yard signs before you leave tonight. We appreciate that. Uh, well, Marvin Smith is not a stranger to Cornerstone Baptist Church. Several years ago, 10 years ago, he was here and then uh, did uh, spiritual warfare conferences. And then last year, we kind of re, if you would, booted, if you would, our spiritual warfare. And we started with level one, and we just wanted to do this every year. And so we, we planned this as soon as he left last uh, year. We, we put this in the calendar for this year. And uh, some of you are new to the church, and uh, I, uh, I, I, I can't say enough about Brother, Brother Smith. He's a friend. He's a friend of preachers. It's often that I'll get a text from him, sometimes Saturday night at uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and uh, just praying for you, preacher, praying for you, and thinking about you, giving me something that is from God's Word, just encouraging me. I'll get that often from him, and, uh, and he does that. And it's not just one of those group texts, you know. It's, it's, it's a personal text from his phone to mine. And I know he just, he loves God's men, he loves God's people, he loves God's work. And uh, I, I, I thank the Lord for God raising him up and doing what he is doing. The material that he has on that table back there before you, when you came in uh, is well worth, anything that you purchase will be well worth your spiritual life and spiritual vitality. And he can mention that throughout the uh, week. But uh, without any further uh, uh, delay, let's have Brother... Smith, come up here and uh, preach to us and uh, as the Lord leads him, and uh, let's listen intently. Amen. 
Brother Mark. Come on, please stand here. Good to see you. What a great crowd. I'm excited about this, okay? And I'd be excited if anybody came to hear me preach. I, I told my church I wouldn't walk across the street to listen to me. So anyway, I'm just glad that you came tonight. And I appreciate, I want to just go back to your pastor. What a, what a, him and I don't, we, we have a friendship that we don't have to maintain. I like that, okay? In other words, when, when I see him, I feel like, okay, we didn't stop liking one another, you know? And uh, so, but I do pray for your pastor. I, I uh, started a prayer ministry of, of uh, uh, ministering to people through prayer, and I won't want to get much into that. It's kind of personal, but but um, uh, he's one of a couple thousand people that that I will send a personal text to uh, in in a week. That uh, and uh, and so uh, it, I, we take it serious at our church. This whole thing of prayer. And uh, I actually have a series up here, I brought up here called Extreme Prayer. And uh, our ministry will have somewhere around 60 uh, prayer meetings a month scheduled at the church. That's what, so when we're talking about prayer, we, that's what we do. And uh, I do feel like until the church of Jesus Christ gets that in order, we're going to constantly lose a lot of battles, okay? So I encourage you, if you want to look into this, this is uh, kind of a pattern that I go on my own personal prayer time. And then this one here is what I did last year, that when I was here about the 12 doors that we can open up to demonic activity and how to close those doors. And then this one's called Yielding Your Rights to Overcome Anger. Everywhere I go, people are angry, and, and anger is a sin. I don't know if you know that or not, but anger is a sin. You say, well, the Bible says be angry and sin. I understand that. I'm talking about when, when your anger is, um, is uh, destroying people, uh, when it's de degrading, whenever it's... Um, uh, it, when, you see, the, the anger that we're supposed to have is toward the devil. Amen. Okay, amen? amen? Okay, help me out now. Okay, I'll slow down, okay? So you might want to get that. If uh, you got an anger problem, you might come up and say, I know somebody that does, so you don't have to tell me you're the one, okay? <laughs> so, and then this one here is uh, stepping in and out of depression, and it's quite extensive. And what, what I, I tell, told last time, um, there were six messages on this uh, that um, I've been, I've had my bouts of uh, warfare and, and depression and, um, and uh, don't wish it upon anybody. But, but understand, most men of God do have that. I don't know if you know that or not. Most men of God, uh, uh, Elijah had that. Jonah had that. The Apostle Paul had depression. And, uh, and I don't have time to name all the ones in the Bible that went through bouts of depression. And uh, God ordered their steps through all of that. Um, this one's called How to Have a Spiritual Marriage. Now, <clears throat> we all need to work on our marriage. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And, uh, but the main emphasis in this, okay, the main emphasis. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Honest, honest. Uh, yeah, you're being transparent. That's all. I'm trying to overlook you right now, okay? <laughs> Here, just to have it. You can have it. <laughs> Never enough. I know. You, you, yeah. ne let's quit. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so I deal inside that my wife does on um, when trust has been violated, okay? And then the rest of them I do, marriage monsters. I do um, a session on how to develop spiritual intimacy in a marriage and how to develop soul intimacy, which creates the right kind of physical intimacy. That's all in that. And then this one here, um, years ago, I came across these. I've been teaching these to my church, 10 scriptural convictions that uh, I believe my wife and me and my children would die for. My children are 40 and 39 now. And, uh, and these are things that we implement into our ministry. And, and, uh, and so there are a lot of things that we say are convictions that I don't think they're convictions. In other words, would we really die for it. So I try to find these, and these are 10. I think you all teach your children. And, uh, and then this one here is the series we're going to be doing this week called It's All in the Head. We're going to be dealing with strongholds tonight. We're going to deal with casting down imaginations tomorrow night. And on Wednesday night, we're going to be dealing with uh, knowledge that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, and then how to bring every thought into captivity under the obedience of Christ. You won't want to miss any of the sessions. There's a lot of books back there. I'll just mention these two this is We Wrestle Not number one, We Wrestle Not number two. The material we're covering this week is in the yellow one back there, okay? And if we sell out, we can always get more sent out to here, okay? 
Again, it's a delight to be here. We have been on a journey as a ministry, I'm telling you, uh, a warfare ministry, uh, a warfare against our ministry. And, and by the way, if the devil's not fighting you, you're not in the fight, okay? And, and let me just say this to you, okay? Remember this statement, because this is something that's resonating in my heart right now, and that is this, is you are never going to live on this earth, if you live for Jesus, you're never going to live on this earth without warfare going on in your life. That may not be encouraging to you, but that's the truth. If you're living for Jesus, you're going to have warfare in your life. And we've got to understand that we are on a battlefield of the highest kind, okay? Now, tonight as we look at this, this subject of it's all in the head, how many of you ever walked up to somebody and, uh, uh, and they said you were telling your problems to them and you said this, you said... Um, uh, told your problems, and then they said, that's all in your head. Anybody ever heard that? Come on. Anybody ever heard that? Oh, that's all in your head? Now, listen to me. That's the truth. It is all in your head. That's the battleground between God and Satan in the life of a believer. It's right here in the mind, okay? As you look at this laying a foundation, I'm sorry. I, it's okay. I feel sorry. I, I want to help out, okay? That's my motivational gift is exhortation, so I'm... Yeah. Ready to kick in here. Now, what, let me take you on a journey. If Satan was defeated in heaven, God threw him out. Remember Isaiah 14? Y'all remember Isaiah. Uh, yeah. Do y'all talk back to the preacher? Do they talk back to you? Okay, well, come on now. Okay, sometimes. No, no, not that kind of talk back, though. No, not. Oh, boy. See, I got another one for you, okay? Yeah, now, yeah, you keep it up, you'll have the whole set, amen? <laughs> so Satan was defeated in heaven, he was kicked out. Satan was defeated on earth when Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus went into the wilderness, and in the wilderness, Jesus beat him on that ground right there, okay? And then, uh, some people kind of debate this, but, you know, debate with me later on this, but I believe Satan was defeated in hell in the fact the Bible says, he that ascended first descended to the lower parts of the earth. I believe Jesus went into the devil's living room and kicked his teeth in and took the keys of death and hell and beat him on his own home front and came out of the grave, amen? Amen. So that's, that's why I believe. So Satan's been defeated on all three fronts. So what's the point? The point is this. Satan's not trying to uh, be, defeat God because he, know, he knows he cannot do that. Now, I saw in a uh, video, not a video, a picture the other day. It was a picture of Jesus and he's arm wrestling Satan. And, uh, and in this picture, Jesus has these humongous biceps and Satan has humongous biceps. And they're like this. And it looks like there's a, like a little bit of a strain going on in this battle as if there really is a conflict. Now, look here. Look here. Listen to me carefully. Is, is uh, Satan and Jesus, that's like a t-ball player trying to hit off Nolan Ryan. Okay? So it's, he's not going to hit the ball. Okay, and so that's a that's a total deception. God, the Bible, Jesus said this, I cast out demons, he said, by the very finger of God. In other words, it doesn't take much for God to defeat the devil, amen? amen? And we need to remind ourselves of that because sometimes we make the devil bigger than what God is in our, in our lives. But Satan knows he can't defeat God. So guess what? Satan's target is not a lost man because the lost man's already his child, amen? And then we, so we see that Satan's target is the church. And you and I are the church, right? Amen? Right. You are the church. Now get this, if you can't beat the dad... And you want to hurt the dad, what do you do? You go after the kids. Now listen, that is an important statement, okay? Is because from the day you got saved, the moment you came to Christ, you came under the crosshairs of his scope, and you became an enemy of Satan. You're a child of God. You once were his children and someone came and told you about Christ and, and they, they were influential with the Holy Spirit and God to bring you out of his family and it's a terrible thing to lose one of your kids. Yeah. Talk to me, amen? And so it doesn't like you. It doesn't like you also because you took his place. He was the head of worship. He led worship and now the church worships God. 
And so you took his place. There's a lot of reasons why the devil doesn't like you tonight. And, uh, and so his target is the church and you as individuals. Look at Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 says this. It says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High. So the battle is on the saints. Who are the saints? We're the saints. Amen. Amen. We're the saints. Amen. We're the, this is Saint Shepherd over here, okay? I'm Saint Smith, okay? And uh, you're not a saint. She's already let me know that, okay? So, so but, but the devil, the Bible says that he's come down and he's speaking great words against the Most High. We're going to look at that verse in just a minute, some more. And he's, and he's where, everywhere I go, God's people are wore out, preacher. Everywhere I go. Now, I understand that. You know, I was t- telling you my battles. It wore me out, brother. Amen. And the enemy's goal is to keep you and I wore out so that we're paralyzed emotionally, mentally, and physically so we're ineffective against his kingdom. Amen. Because I don't know if you realize this or not, but you and I are to be weapons in the hands of Almighty God. That's really too. When you look at the scriptures, it says that neither yield yourselves as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now the word instrument in the Strong's Concordance, if you look at that, it means a weapon. That's what that word instrument means. It's a weapon. It's a warfare instrument. And God says, don't yield your bodies to, as instruments of unrighteousness or weapons of unrighteousness, but start yielding yourself as weapons of righteousness. In other words, God needs people people and he can depend upon that he can pull you out of his sheath and use you to do great damage against the kingdom of darkness. And so we see here he's wearing out the saints and then we see here and in Revelations it says and it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Not with lost people, with saints. The war is on your children and your children your marriage and, and your church. It's serious stuff with him, okay? He's, he works 24-7, 7 days a week 365 days a year, every moment of the day trying to destroy the effectiveness of your life. So we got to understand this. because, And so, guys, people walk around ignorant. The Bible Paul said that for we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen. At least Satan should get the advantage of us. And so I'm going to try to educate you some in the way that Satan gets the advantage of us. The Bible says in Revelation, for the devil has come down unto you. It's talking about the church having great wrath, knowing he, he hath but a short time. Uh, I heard a good preacher one day on the radio, and he's a good preacher, he's really good, but, but he's wrong in what he said. He said that, that Satan thinks he's going to win. Satan does not think he's going to win. He knows the Bible. He knows what's going on. In fact, he, he, it says in the Bible, he knows he has a short time now. Boy, I'm, I tell you what, I can't wait to that day, amen? I cannot wait to his, the grains of sand run out on his time glass, amen? Now, let's do a little foundational teaching here. We did a little bit of this last time I was here. Let me do it briefly with you. The Bible says in, in the beginning that when God made man, it says, and God said, let, it man, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So we understand what that means. Is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit come together and not as they're apart. They are one. But somewhere or another, they come together. They take counsel together. They're going to make man. They're going to make man in his image and after his likeness. Well, God's a triune God. We know that, amen. So when God made us, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when God made us, just like God's a triune God, God made us a triune being, and he made us a spirit, a soul, and a body. Does that make sense? Say amen. Amen. All right. So when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to dwell inside of you, okay? And that's where he resides in your spirit area. That's where he rules and reigns in the center of your man. That's the most important part of your being is your spirit area, okay? Uh, You must be mighty. The Bible talks about being mighty in spirit, okay? And so we must be that way. So the Spirit of God lives in there. This is what we'd call your inward man. The Bible says your outward man, your body, and 
and, and I would say your soul too, your mind and emotions, okay? The Bible says your outward man are perishing. You know, as you get older, your mind begins to get weaker. Your body begins to get weaker. Amen? Am I talking to you? Amen? Is that true or what? Amen? Okay, so we begin to lose, but, but he says your spirit area is to be, he says um, the outer man perishes, but the inward man, inner man is being renewed day by day. So spiritually, guess what? If we fade out physically and soulish wise, we can go, we become more mighty in our spirit realm. Well, anyway, I wish I had time to just talk about that tonight. But th this is the heart of you. This is where you said, Jesus asked you to come into my heart and save me, okay? And uh, so G the Spirit of God came to live inside of you. Now, your soul, this is where the battlefield is. Because, see, Satan can't have that red dot. That's been sealed up until the day of redemption. Right. Eternal security, amen? amen? But your soul, which is made up of your mind, how you think, and it's made up of your emotions, that's how you feel, and it's made up of your will, that's the choices you make. Satan knows that, that, that how you think determines how you feel, how you feel determines how you act. Is that right? I mean, if you think in a carnal way, you have carnal emotions, if you have carnal emotions, you can start acting out carnally. Correct. And then, but if I think in the mind of Christ, then I'm going to have the emotions of Christ, and I'm going to act like Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why the Bible tells you to keep your mind stayed on him. Amen? That's why the, Paul said this twice in Philippians, that now you have the mind of Christ, so that you would operate in his mind, and that you might be able to feel like Jesus feels so that you'll act like Jesus acted. And he's waiting on a church to be like that. Yep. Well, anyway, the battlefield is in your mind. It's in that area there. Satan can get in your mind. He's got control of you. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, verse 3 through 6 there, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we war not after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. So let me talk about those three those. Uh, four things there. And um, we're going to come at backwards. You see on the screen there, you see the highlighted words we're going to talk about backwards thought, knowledge, imagination, strongholds. Now answer this question out loud. The, the answer is on the screen. If you get this one wrong, you, there's no hope for you, okay? <laughs> Got it? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Where are thoughts? In Thank you. <laughs> Pretty good for a Baptist church. <laughs> Thoughts are in your head. Are these warfare scriptures? Talk to me. These are warfare scriptures. So he's telling you the battle is in your thoughts. Where's knowledge? It's in the head. It's all in the mind. And, and so where are imaginations? Where are images? Now, if thoughts, if knowledge, and if... Um, uh, uh, imaginations are in the head, then it must be strongholds are in the head. Right. Yeah. Got it? So some of you don't even know you have a stronghold going on. But we're going to discover that tonight. So now, the, what is a stronghold? It's a lie. It's a false idea that a person believes is true and it's so true to them that it, it holds them in bondage. It literally holds them in bondage by those thoughts. And so Satan will plant a lie in your head. And you, when you start believing the lies, then your lies are going to be start, strongholds are going to be start setting up in your head. For instance, there are three categories or three definite ways Satan's going to lie to you. You ready? This is important. Right here is very important. He's going to lie to you. Number one, he's going to lie to you about God. Okay? Lie to you about God. Remember the Bible says that he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints? See, he lies to you about God. We're going to look at that in just a moment. Lie, lie category number two, he lies to you about others. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. You see what he'll do to you? He'll lie to you about your wife to you. He'll lie to you about your husband to you. He'll lie to you about somebody over here uh, uh, in your mind, uh, about somebody over there. He'll lie, he'll lie to you about your preacher. He'll lie to you about people. And guess what? He, when you begin to believe the lies about others, okay? We got a rule in our church and in our staff, and our, we, we really promote this as we're not going to live suspicious with one another. 
That's the important thing. Right. Don't live suspicious. If you live suspicious, then that, may, that keeps you at an arm's distance from each other. Because yeah. you're living suspicious. Don't live suspicious, okay? Now, he'll lie to you about God. He'll lie to you about others. In third category, he's going to lie to you about yourself. He's the condemner. He's going to lie to you about yourself. Now, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you think wrong, that's how you're going to be. Yep. Got me? How you think determines how you are going to conduct yourself. So our enemy knows that how we think about God, how we think about others, how we think about ourselves is going to determine how we feel and how we act. Right. Are you okay? Yep. Yep. Not going too fast. So John 8, 44 says this about the devil, because there's no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and he's the father of it. So all these lies, and by the way, I'm telling you, I've been, this is like my 20th year of teaching this material right here. Of course, it's been added to because it grows more. But for 20 some years, I've been studying these lies. And preacher, I'm going to tell you something. Just two weeks ago, I was hearing those lies. Did you hear what I just said? See, you're never immune of the lies. The only way you can deal with them is you've got to recognize the lie. Yep. And we're going to teach you how to do that, okay? So let's do this. Now, everybody's got to play, okay? You're on my playground. You've got by my rules. Got it? Got it. Okay. I got it. Okay. I knew you did. I knew you did. He doesn't. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll give you that I'm set, too. Uh, I got another set for you. Yeah. <laughs> now, look. Lies about God. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to say this. I'm going to say, how many of you have heard this in your mind at some time? And all I want you to do is raise your hand. Now, don't go like this. Okay? Go like that. Okay? All right? Well, let's practice. Okay, everybody do this. Uh, boy, I tell you. How about this? How many of you have ever heard this one in your head? God does not really love me. Anybody ever heard that? Now, leave it up. Leave it up. Now, I'm not, folks... Look all over. See, keep it up there, okay? We're all in this boat together. Look around. Look around. Right. Satan does a good job, doesn't he? Yeah. And yet, you know, you know in your mind, for God so loved the world. Mm -hmm. And you know in your mind that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. But still, the lie comes to you, and sometimes those scriptures fade, and the lie becomes strong, and you begin to believe that God really doesn't really love me. How about this one here? God does not really accept me. As you raise your hand up. God does not accept me. I can't wait to teach you more about that in just a moment. God does not accept me. That's a tough one. Okay? Because preacher, all over the country, wherever I go, this room right here in my counseling center, we, this thing comes up all the time about people not feeling accepted by God. How about this one here? How many would say, you know, God does not care about me? Does anybody feel that way? Come on, be honest, okay? God does not care about me. There you go. How about this one? God's not fair. Huh? Huh? Now, now look, look here. See, see, I've heard preachers say, you know, God's not fair. God doesn't have to be fair. Look, God's always fair. Right. Listen to me. See, you and I cannot judge what's fair and what's not fair. We don't have the ability for that. See, God sees life from up here, folks, looking down on you. He sees where you're at. He sees where he's taking you. And so whatever you're going, listen, this is true. Whatever you're going through is taking you where he wants you to go. This is not God being fair or not fair. This is God knowing where he wants to take you. 
I mean, folks, listen, I mean, when you think about it, Joseph in the Bible, I just finished Genesis this morning, and, and when you look at Joseph in the Bible, and was his brothers fair to him? It doesn't look like they were fair to him. Was God fair to him? It doesn't seem fair to me to be sold into slavery as a teenage boy, does it to you? And then to be what? To, to be uh, put in prison, falsely accused of, of, of some central immoral, immoral act and spend time in prison for that. You with me? But folks, God knew all that, didn't he? Talk to me. God was, take, God was taking him on a journey, preacher. And guess what? He ended up where God wanted him. By the way, it, it's God blessed him. Well, anyway, God is not fair. Sometimes you hear that. How about this one? Is God cares about others more than you. Anybody? See, preachers have that problem. Did you know that? I mean, here, we, you know, I've been at my church 28 and a half years. You've been there a long time, haven't you? How long? 21 years. 21 years. And, and, you know, like, like 28, 21 years in a church, and, and, uh, and you, you, you scrape, and you, and you preach, and you love, and you, and you minister to people, and, and people leave, and people come, and, and people say, I love you, and I'll always be your friend, and, and you know how that goes, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and then some young buck comes to town, and, and uh, he gets a storefront, and he has more people than you're running in, in two years, and you've been 21 years, you're thinking, you know, God must love that guy more than me. But folks, listen to me. It's a, it's a dumb thing. I, that's a good word. Right? It's a dumb thing for you and I to compare ourselves with ourselves. How about this one here? God, how many ever thought God cannot use me? Would you raise your hand up really high if you think God can use you? No, leave it up, leave it up, Let's leave it up. Well, I'm going to say something to you with your hands up. You are more qualified to be used of God than many of the people that didn't raise their hand. Because God uses people that have to have him. See, the reason why you feel like God can't use you is because you keep looking at your past. And you think in your past, I blew it. I blew this, I blew that. God can't use, look at me, look at me. Look at who God used in the Bible. God didn't have a whole lot to work with. Amen? He still doesn't have a whole lot to work with. I'm looking at this bunch right here. Amen? I, I'm not talking about you now. So, so God cannot use, how about this one? Is God, how many of you thought, man, I've been to the altar 442 and a half times. I got halfway there and went back. God, over the same stinking sin, and I just feel like God cannot forgive me another time. How many of you ever felt that way? God cannot forgive me. All right. How about this one here? Is God cannot be trusted. You say, I was trusting God. I was trusting God. And you know what? He did not come through for me. How many of you ever thought God cannot be trusted? Anybody? Yeah. And then we see the category number two is lies about others. How many's ever had this thought? Nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Isn't that amazing, preacher? Right. Nobody cares. How about this one? Nobody loves me. Ever been there? Yeah. Nobody loves me. Right. Bow your head, preacher. <laughs> okay, we're not going to do this one. All you, all you got to do is this is wink at me, okay? <laughs> I was, I, was, I was in a church, I was preaching this, this is a country church up in Michigan, and uh, we had a dead-end gravel road. Great crowd of people out there. And I said, that Satan lies to you and tells you your preacher's against you. And I could tell it was a cut across the nerve of some lady about halfway back. And she poked her husband really hard and started talking to him. And, and when that happens, I know after church, I, I need to find an exit somewhere. <laughs> well, anyway, there were no exits up front, so I had to go out that way. And here she come with her husband. But he actually, she was like 10 feet ahead of him. He's like, oh, no. And she come right up to me and she said, now you said that this is a lie, that the preacher's against you. And I said, yeah, it is. She says, no, no, no. I said, okay, tell me. She said, the other day we got out of our car in the parking lot. Him and his wife were standing at the front door. 
and they were shaking hands with everybody. And about two couples before us, it was almost like they looked right at us and they turned around and went inside. They didn't want to shake our hand. Now, I'm a little honorary. Now, I used to be honorary, so I don't do this anymore. But, but I said, um, oh, my goodness, he's against you. And she poked her husband and said, I told you. I told you. I told that man smart. I said, please tell me more. She said, okay. She said, I was in the hospital for three days. He never come to see me. I said, did you call the church and tell him you were in the hospital? No, he knew. I said, I don't know. Doesn't sound like he likes you. She said, top it off. He preached on marriage the other day, and we was all down at the altar, couples everywhere. Him and his wife were praying over a couple, and they were kind of randomly going, and he never prayed over us. I said, I'd move my membership. <laughs> and she poked her husband and said, see? He said, honey, we've been here 25 years. I said, ma'am, can I tell you something? She said, what? I said, I'm just goofing off. I don't know of a preacher that loves his people more than your preacher. I said, the devil's lied to you and lied to you and lied to you. And can I tell you something, lady? Because of that, you are not growing spiritually. Now, when he preaches, you know what? All you can see is he, he's against you. And so you interpret all of his messages, don't you, hon, at, the, at you, don't you? And her husband said that's exactly what she does. Everything he says is against her. Folks, listen to me. The devil will do whatever he's got to do to turn your heart away from your pastor. How about this one? Is the church does not accept me. This is a tough one. This, the church does not accept me. Okay, anybody. Okay, now that happens. That happens. All right? But now look at me. That's a lie. These are not true statements. How about this one? No one understands me. Raise your hand up high. No one understands me. <laughs> How about this one? Everyone's a hypocrite. There's a little hippo in all of us. Okay? But, folks, I want to tell you something. It's not everybody's this extreme mammoth hypocrite. You've you got to understand, people are on a journey. And, and some people are, they're sincere as can be. But there might be some areas of their life that are sincerely wrong. That doesn't make them a hypocrite. Talk to me. How about this one here? If your mom and dad are here, do not play in this, okay? <laughs> my, parents, my parents do not love me or my parents did not. Like my parents all passed away. My parents did not love me when they, we were like, or my parents do not love me. They're alive, okay? Would you dare to raise your hand up, okay, on that, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Get a spanking when you get home. <laughs> you want to find out how much I love you? <laughs> you know, this is huge in a lot of people's lives here. And uh, how about this one? My, okay, we're not going to raise our hands, okay? <laughs> my husband or my wife do not raise your hands. They, they do not love me. There are a lot of people that feel like their spouse does not love them. These are all lies. How about this one here? Lies about yourself. I will never amount to anything. Would you raise your hand up? I will never amount to anything. Is that it? Come on. I will never amount to anything. When I look at my life, for the glory of God, I'm not going to amount to anything. I was in a Bible college, a large one. 1,500 students were in the chapel service that day. And I said this in that chapel service. I said, how many believe... I had a bow their head for some reason. The Lord led me to have a bow their head. How many feel like you'll never amount to anything? And I said, all their heads were bowed. I said, would you just stand up? And I'm going to tell you, the majority of the students in the Bible college felt like I'll never amount to anything. 
This is in a Bible college where they're being trained for the ministry. And they've already been convinced, I probably won't amount to anything. And some of you don't feel like you can amount to anything for God. And that, my friend, because you have that, listen to me, because you have that particular lie, it's because the devil knows that God really wants to use you. How many of you ever had this? Uh, uh, let me explain this to you, okay? I, I was in a church, relatively large church, and I didn't say this right. And I said, how many believe in your mind that I'm stupid? <laughs> and they did just that. And I thought, I really hit a nerve here. I, wasn't, I was being stupid, I guess. Uh, I wouldn't catch any were laughing at me. I said, that's a lot of you. And, uh, but you know what I'm saying. How many in your brain, maybe someone, did, by the way, some of the lies that we believe are from Satan, but guess what? They came through the mouth of people. Yeah. As you're growing up, the dad says, you're just stupid. I was sitting in my office one day, and um, a man came in, my wife's my uh, secretary, and he came in, he was a, a sheriff. And he came in. He said, I need to see the pastor. And my wife says, there's a sheriff out here. I thought, oh, great. <laughs> Caught up with me. And he came in. And he stood across the desk from me and began to weep, 52 years old. And he said this, I can't get the voices to stop. I said, well, sir, now what do the voices say? They say, you're stupid. You're never about to do anything. You're worthless. I said, is that voice your dad? He said, yes. See, mom and dad, the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Yep. And you can be used of the enemy to set your kids on a course of emotional and spiritual destruction. You hear me? Let every word be seasoned with grace. So, so I said, I mean, well, how many of you tonight would say, you know, I've heard, heard that in my head. I'm just stupid. Raise your hand up. Yeah. See? Okay. How about this one? You said, you know, when I look at myself, I know this is personal. I feel like I'm just ugly. Would you raise your hand up? Okay. Now look at me. Look at me. Why do you think you're ugly? That's important to ask. Because the truth of the matter is, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Yep. And if I painted a beautiful picture, and you walked in and said, that's ugly, that would offend me. Now listen to me, you offend your God by looking at yourself like you're ugly. And the reason why you think you're ugly is you keep comparing yourself with what television and Hollywood in this world that says beautiful. Come on, talk to me. True. And you've got to quit doing that stuff. How many's had this? I, I can't get victory. I, I just I can't get victory. Anybody? Raise your hand up. Can't victory. How about this one? As I'm worthless. How many's ever felt worthless? Raise your hand up high. Get it up there. Let me say this to all you hands up. Listen, you're not worthy, but you're not worthless. Remember that. You say, why do you say it? Because look, if you were worthless. Look what Jesus did. Jesus bought you with his own blood. He must have seen something in us. Amen? That had some form of value. If he could ever get in our life, he could bring incredible value to us. How many ever had this? I'm filthy and dirty and I cannot be used. Anybody? Okay. Okay, how about this one? I'm, now, what I'm talking about here is when you look at yourself, you don't, you don't accept yourself. I'm not accepted by myself. This is a lie about yourself. It was ever feel like I don't accept me. Okay. I felt that was a big lie in my life when I was a kid. Uh, I was born in, in my dad died when I was three, and mom never took us to a dentist. She couldn't afford a dentist. Three kids, single parent mom. All my teeth were rotten from a, from a small child. I had toothaches all the way till I was a junior in high school. People tried to get me to smile. No way am I going to smile. I had snaggle teeth. They were gray and they were rotten. 
they'd break off sometimes at lunch, and I just, ah. And anyway, I had an accident, had them all knocked out, and got these, okay? Pretty good deal. When I was 17, and had an accident. And so my point making is, I always felt like I was not accepted because of my teeth. I mean, you might, you might feel some other reason why you're not accepted. I don't know. Maybe intellectually or maybe physically or some, your, your physical status or whatever it might be. You're, you feel like I'm not accepted. How many of you have had this one? I will never be loved. I will ne- You've ever thought that? I'll never be loved. Anybody? Okay, so people need to be loved. And the devil will tell you you're never going to be loved. You know why he wants you to say that? It's because, listen, he, if you're a single person, he wants you to go settle for anybody, anywhere. And last of all, on this lie here, I cannot do anything for God. My work is not important. Sort, not size. And I put that up there because when we stand before God, our work's not going to be judged uh, in the kingdom by the size of your work. It'll be judged by the sort of work that we did. But how many has ever felt like, I cannot do really anything for God, my work's not important? Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher, you think, ah, it's not all that important. I work with kids, or children's church, or on a bus, or I don't run buses, but, but you know what I'm saying? Yep. Listen, listen. These are all lies from the enemy, right? Yep. So now, if we've identified all these lies, we have many hands up. How many, how many of you discovered one or more lies. Everybody raise your hand. Raise your hand once. At least raise it up right now and get it up in the air, okay? Okay, get it up there, okay? Okay. Almost everybody here, preacher, okay? Okay, so Satan's been doing a pretty good work in the lives of God's children here, okay? Which he does everywhere. So, how do you combat a lie? Someone tell me. Truth. You got to have truth to combat lies. You know, the greatest, some of the greatest truths that I've found, I'm going to go up here just a minute here. Uh, some of the greatest truths that I've found is the, uh, in my life that's helped me out is to discover my position in Jesus Christ. Yep. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you this, okay? Is, um, now, what we're going to do here to get into this is you see the line there that says, I've been crucified with Christ. Can you all see that? Yep. I've been crucified with Christ. Now, every slide from here out is going to have one of the, a line like that up there, or just a statement. We won't read the scriptures. But here's what I want to do with you is when we get to the next slide that comes up, I'm going to have you read all of that, out, that, that one line out loud, okay? So first of all, if you're going to combat the enemy, you've got to figure out what your position is in Jesus Christ. Now, what is my position, okay? First of all, I have been crucified with Christ. The Apostle Paul said that, I've been crucified with Christ. In Romans 6, know this, the old man has been crucified with him. Now look here, what does that mean? What does that mean? I believe what it means is 2,000 years ago on the cross, he took you in himself. You were crucified in Jesus on the cross. He took you, brother, in himself. You were crucified in Christ on the cross. You, my brother, you were crucified in Christ on the cross. If you could imagine, get in your mind, uh, Jesus on that cross up there right now, and you could look deep down inside him, you would be in him. You were crucified in Jesus Christ. He took us all in himself. And was crucified. And if you were crucified, then guess what? Then you were buried in Christ. So what I want you to do is I want you everybody to say, I have been crucified in Christ. Say it. I have been crucified in Christ. Secondly, say the next line. I am buried in Christ. If you were crucified with Christ, then he took you into the tomb in Christ. You were buried with him. You notice what it says up there, therefore we are buried with him. And then for we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. Planted means put into the ground. When you died on the cross in Christ, he then you went into the grave with him. You were buried with him. And if you were crucified and buried with him, then guess what? Anybody want to guess the next one? Yeah, you've been raised up in Jesus Christ, okay? Everybody say that with me. I have been raised up in Christ. You were raised up in Christ. The Bible tells us if we've been planted together in likeness, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Ephesians says, and he hath raised us up together in Christ. 
So Marvin Smith was crucified in Christ, thank God, buried in Christ, and rose in Jesus Christ. But not only was I crucified, buried, and risen, but guess what? The Bible tells us we go to another level, and that is this. I have been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If I was on the cross in him, I was buried in him, I was raised in him. The Bible says that he went up into heavens. The Bible says right there, and he went up and he sat down at the own right, his own right hand, the heavenly places next to the Father. The, Jesus was here. Um, uh, can I get just a, some help, preacher, okay? Is uh, give me... Um, uh, give me three chairs, um, yeah, I guess right here. I didn't want everybody to see it. I'm afraid the people over here won't. But give me, g give me some more guys to help out, okay? Now I need stackable chairs, preacher, okay? Yeah, stackable, three, three stackable chairs right here. Yeah, yeah, just, let's see. Uh, preacher, I think they're getting them for you. Yeah? They're going. That doesn't matter to me. He didn't have no place to sit. That's planned. Yeah. That's a cool move there, brother. Yeah. Yeah, right. Just like that. That's fine. Now, I wish you all could see this over here, okay? But, but uh, I'm going to get this far over here. Yeah, sorry. Now, watch this here. The Bible says, the Bible says this, is that God the Father sits here, okay? And then it says this, that Jesus went up into heaven and sat down at his right hand in heavenly places. You got it? Yeah. You with me? And where does he sit? He sits, the Bible says, far above all principalities and powers. And the words far above means it's an immeasurable distance from the head of Satan to the feet of Jesus. Yep. That's what that means. Yes, far above all principalities and powers. Okay? And, then, and he's made the head of the church. But then it says this. It says in chapter 2, And hath raised us together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, so here's what I used to teach. I used to teach God the Father is here and God the Son is here and the church now is seated together in heavenly places. But that, here's, it goes further than that. You were in Christ on the cross. You were in Christ in the tomb. You were raised in Christ so that you're not seating independently from him. You're seated together with him. You are in Christ. You with me? You are in Christ. You were in his crucifixion. You were in his burial. You were in his resurrection. And you are in Christ right now. If you're a saved person, you're in Christ. And you are seated together with him in heavenly places. And if he... I feel bad about you sitting back there, brother. Here. There you go. Set it together in Christ. So, so uh, my point is this. My point is this, folks. Listen, is whatever position Christ has, it's hard for Baptists to get this. You have it. You're in Him. See now, look. What happens is the devil lies to you and tells you you're not worthy, you're nothing, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything, God can't use you. And you know what he does? He talks you down out of your position. You with me? He has talked most of God's people down out of their position. And when you come down out of your position, you're subject to him. But when you sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, he is subject to you. Oh, folks, yep. we didn't, look, preacher, God didn't put, it, I mean, I got a boy, my boy is an athlete, I'm telling you, man, he gets up at 10 after 4 in the morning, he does all these, you know, real crazy stuff, like, you know, whatever, rides 15 miles on a bike, and runs and pumps weights, I said, look at my body, you, you, I don't do none of that, I, <laughs> But listen, if, 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 if I was just, as his father and I had him in a ring against the enemy, and that enemy's mammoth and powerful, and I said to Marvin, he says, now I want you to go in there and wrestle him. I, I just want you to know you can't beat him. He's, he's going to destroy you. But I want you to go do that. Folks, that's not a good dad. 
And yet the Bible says that God has called us into a battle, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Those principalities, according to the scriptures I had up there earlier, is those principalities, we are far above them. You with me? I don't know if you're getting it or not, but where's it at? Thank you. Okay, so everybody say this powerful truth out loud. Everybody, I want it to ring in here. Here we go. And you mark, set, go. The more you reaffirm who you are in Christ, the more your behavior will begin to reflect your true identity. So in my prayer room, in my prayer room, what we're going to do next, we're going to go through a list of things. They're all over my prayer wall. I've got a wall right here. And on this wall, it's who God is. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the Beginning, the End, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Messiah, Jehovah, the Prince of Peace, the Seed, the Son of God, the Seed of Abraham, the Second Person in the Trinity. You're the Redeemer. You're the Justifier. You're the Mediator with, uh, between man and God. You're the Advocate with the Father. You're the Lily of the Valley. You're the Rose of Sharing. You're the Way, the Truth, the Life. I love talking about that. Amen. And I'll be in my prayer room. And I'll just, I'll just say, I'll reinforce who I'm talking to. You're the God of the universe. And then on this wall is who I am. And on this wall, I'm going to show you what, what is on my wall in my prayer room. And the more I reaffirm who I am in him, the more my behavior begins to reflect that my true identity. See, some of you, he's beat you down with these lies. You don't, you're not living up to your true identity in Christ. Yeah. True. Amen. Amen. So, who are we in Christ? You're going, to, you're going to read the top line of this, okay? Ready, set, go. I am accepted. I'm accepted. You with me? I'm accepted. Folks, listen to me. You see, look, see if this will work here. Uh, can you all see the green light up there? Say yes or no. Okay, so we're going to take that all the way down to the floor here, and this is where I was before I got saved. Up there is the acceptance of God. You got me? And the moment I got saved, in 1964 is when I got saved. And so in 1964, I, I asked Jesus to save me, and I went right up there. I was totally accepted by God. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But did I get there by my good works? No. Did I get there because I'm a good guy? No. No. I, I, got, I went from here to there because of what he did on the cross. Okay, and so watch this, and watch this. This is how we almost believe sometimes, is we go up here, we got saved, now we're accepted by God, and then sometimes what we begin to believe is I, I kind of got in the flesh, and I haven't been reading my Bible, and I haven't won anybody to Christ in a long time, and you know what, I've been having a bad time in my relationship with my wife and my husband, and I've, and I've really messed up, and, I got, and so we began to think, that because of our bad performances that we are no longer accepted by God. True. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But listen to me. Your acceptance was never based on your performance in the first place. Right. It was based on the work of the cross, the finished work of Calvary. Amen. So when God thinks about you, the thoughts that he thinks toward you folks is that not he, they're thoughts of peace and, and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Look, at, look here. Is, I don't know your name. What's your name? Joe. Son-in-law. Son-in-law. Oh, there you go. I understand why you're oh, that far. I'm, Great gap I'm fixed between the two. Yeah. Amen. So now, now here's the deal. Is, um, is, is he is accepted in Christ. Okay? God's accepted you. And, and this is weird. There's nothing you can do to make him not accept you. Now, you look at me. You look at me. I got two kids. One's 40. One's 38 or 39. I can't remember. Okay? They both at times have done things that broke my heart. You with me? But can I tell you something? When they broke my heart... I did not go, that's it. That's it. You're not accepted. I had a preacher call me the other day, preacher, and he said, my son is doing something he shouldn't be doing. He said, I've called all my preacher friends, and they say, kick him out of the house and get rid of him. 
I said, seriously? He's your son. Why don't you just go put your arms around him and love him? Amen. Say, son, I'm going to walk through this with you. I'm going to help you. Amen? Amen? See, folks, God accepted me, and now I'm accepted in the beloved. Say this one here. I am God's child. Come on, everybody play. I am God's child. Yeah, I'm one of his kids. You hear me? In my office, I, I have a sucker tree. It's about that tall. It's got 400 suckers. It's a beautiful tree, and it's got people keep it stocked. And when church gets over, all the kids in the church just peel out, running out of there, running straight in my office. Why do I do that? I want them to feel very comfortable coming to their preacher's office. So they come running into my office, and I kind of go through a side door, and I go in, and I meet them there. And they go, how'd you get in here? Uh, I walk through doors and walls. That's how I do that. <laughs> and I'm sitting there when they get in there. And they come out, I say, get a sucker, and they start pulling them out. Now, Ethan... Yeah, it was back when he was 10. He's now graduated from high school this May, past May. But when he was 10, he came in my office with another kid. And the kid went over there and went, oh, look at these suckers. And Ethan goes, yeah, you can have a sucker. So the kid took a sucker. Then Ethan went over to my desk drawer and pulled out the right-hand bottom drawer. In there, Nestle Crunches and Hershey candy bars and, I mean, peanut butter, Reese's peanut butter, oh, the stash. So what you said, that's what I'm going to. Is, 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 is my, his friend said, what's that? And my, my grandson said, that's the stash. <laughs> I was watching through the window, listening to him. He goes, that's the stash. And that kid went to grab, and my Ethan shut the drawer almost on his hands and said, no. He said, what do you mean? You got one? He says, yeah, but I'm one of his kids. <laughs> See, for that drawer is there for the kids. Now, it gets to me. If you're a child of God, you are welcome to the stash. And some of you live like you can't have the stash. Because you know what? You look at yourself, you don't see yourself perfect. You're never going to be perfect. But you're sure welcome to the stash. Oh, well. How about this one? Say that out loud. I am Christ's friend. Most people never see themselves as Christ's friend. They always see themselves maybe as he's Lord or he's master. Those are good things. He's God, yeah. He's judge, we know that. But listen, him and I are friends. That's what the Bible says up there. It says, I've called you friends. And a friend that sticks closer than a brother. How about this one here? Say that real out loud. Ready? I am justified. What does that mean? That it was declared in the courtroom of God that Marvin Smith is totally justified of all past, present, and future sins. As I stand here, I am justified of all my sins. If you're saved, you've been justified of your sins. All your sins have been justified. If they're not all justified, you say, well, wait a second, I got saved, and then what about the sins after I got saved? You know, what about them? Well, listen to me. If he didn't justify you of all your sins, then the moment you sin after you got saved, you'd be lost again. You'd have to get justified of that one. He, on 2,000 years ago, he took care of your, all of your, all your sins were future at that point. He took care of them all back there. How about this one here? Say it. I'm united with the Lord. And there's nothing that can separate us from him. Right. Nothing. How about this? Say it. I'm a member of Christ's body. Oh, this is important. Yeah. Um, my wife, her motivational gift is servant. And we're big on spiritual gifts. In fact, I just finished teaching that last night at my church for like the fifth time about motivational gifts. So anyway, we did. Hers is servant. And my wife will literally, you know what a servant does? They vacuum themselves to bed. They, they. <laughs> I mean, they work from, I mean, from the time your feet hit the floor till they go to bed at night. And she was up vacuuming and I was in bed. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, she turned the vacuum sweeper off and she turned the lights off and she got in bed. I was so thankful that she quit. And we're laying there. And I decide I needed some water. And so I get up in the middle of the night, went out of the bedroom, went around the corner. And I, this was in another house that we lived in at the time. It was a two-story house. And uh, you got to come out like this and then go down the steps to, to the kitchen. And I came around there. And my wife doesn't have one of them cheap plastic vacuum sweepers. It's a Kirby. You know what a Kirby's made of? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. It's made of the same steel that was in my 1953 Ford bumper. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the real stuff, amen? amen? They must have melted those old cars down and made Kirby vacuum sweepers because when I came around, you know, I was, I was being a nice husband. I didn't want to turn the lights on and wake up my sweetheart. So I just came around, and there's that vacuum sweeper. My toe went up underneath it, and it broke my toe. I mean, it, it's like, snap, you heard it. And I went, I grabbed my foot. Now, you understand, there's a stairwell right here. And I snapped, my toe snapped, and I got, and I go, ah, ah. I caught the size of the wall, but my foot hit the ground, went, ah, ah. And I'm like, oh, oh. My wife, in the dark, sweet Alice, says, what's going on? Now, this is not what any man should do. I said, what idiot, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I know what, there's only, oh. I said, what idiot left the vacuum sweeper? Now, everybody knows I don't run a vacuum sweeper, so we know who the idiot is, <laughs> right? I said, what idiot left the vacuum sweeper right here? It's quiet. And she said, well, what idiot walks around in the dark? <laughs> Now, I said all that because, listen, when I'm sitting there on the edge of the bed the next morning and my toes black and blue, all my affections, all my mind is on that hurting part of my body. Now, look at me. This is important. You're a part of the body of Christ. You're part of the body of Christ. And when you hurt, all of God's affections come upon you. He sees you. In fact, the body of Christ should immediately engage. My eyes, my ears, my emotions went to my toe when I hurt. And you're a member of Christ's body. How about this? Say it. I've been adopted as God's child. What a wonderful thing he said. In the Bible days, in the Roman era, there is, uh, if you adopted a boy that was, your, uh, that was not your biological son, obviously not adopted, but you had a biological son, son 16, then you adopted a boy that's 16, and your biological son disappointed you and rebelled against you, you could write them out of the inheritance. But your adopted son could never be written out of the inheritance. You know what he's saying? I can't get rid of you. And you said, well, that gives us a license to sin. No, it does not. It gives you a whole new appreciation to live right for God. How about this? Say this. I have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. Folks, this means you have access to God at all times. And therefore, you should come boldly before us to the throne of grace. How about this? Say this. I've been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. This stuff's on my wall in my basement. How about this? I am complete in Christ. How about this one? I am a saint. How about this one? I am a branch of the true vine and a channel of his life. Isn't that good? That's what God says about me. How about this? I cannot be separated from the love of God. Everybody say that. I cannot be separated from the love of God. There's nothing that can ever, brother, separate you from God's love. Nothing. This is what he says. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? For I am persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, nor things present, nor things come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creatures shall be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. That's not me saying that. God said that about me and you. There's absolutely nothing. God, God will always love you. God will always love you. He's not like men. God will always love you. In fact, he wows you. When he thinks about you, he goes, wow. Isn't that wonderful? And then how our concept, see, Satan would get our concept of God messed up. And how you think about God is how you think. If it's warped, your religion becomes warped. How about this? Say it. I am assured that all things work together for my good. Is that true? 
All things? How about this? I've been established, anointed, and sealed by God. That is an unbelievable statement there. He says, now he who establishes us is with you in Christ Jesus, has also anointed us as God, that's God the Father, and who has sealed us, has given us the earnest of the Spirit. So you got the Trinity doing a work in you. Say this one, okay? I'm assured that the good work that God has begun in me will be perfected. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. Let me say, can I pick on you a minute? Okay. God began a good work in you. You remember when that began? Yeah. And he's never going to quit doing that. In fact, he can't quit on you. Because he said right there that, that, that the work he began, he's going to perform it until when? Until the day of Jesus Christ. God can never quit working on you. He's committed to you. Amen. Where, look, someone says, well, well, I'm worried about that person. They're, they're outside of the will of God. Look at me. Look at me. God's working on them. Yep. If they're a child of God, God's working on them. Yeah. I got some loved ones right now that I, I've got a little concerned about. But you know what helps me? God is working on them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right now. He's working on them. Yep. How about this? Say that loud. I am significant. Oh, say that one more time. I am significant. That's important. I want you to notice something. You know the scriptures I, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But notice where it says, I don't think you can see it back there, but it says, it says, uh, and in thy book all, um, all my members are written. Do you know what that means? That means what was God doing before everything was created? God was a designer. He designed everything. In fact, when it came time to design you, brother, okay, he designed you. There is literally in heaven a book. And when you get to heaven, go to God and say, God, show me this. I think he'll show, take you to a library. You ever seen old libraries where the ladder is on, on the rollers? And there's like books all the way ceiling. And go in there and say, he'll know your name. He'll say, get on there. And he'll just kind of go push you down through there and go, okay, go about 445 shelves up. And you're going to see a book on the right. Your name's on that. Grab that, come down. And you know what? When you get that book, all the members of you, every finger, every toenail, every hair, every eyelash, everything about you is in a book. God spent time designing me. I'm not junk. I'm not ugly. I'm not stupid. I'm not an idiot. I, I am. God designed me. Amen. Amen? It's important. Because when you lose that identity, then you become totally defeated in your mind about your self-worth. Hello? about this one here say that I have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit oh I love this one in my neighborhood growing up we had a bunch of guys get together and play ball in my grandma's field in the back we built a backstop we'd cut the grass where it looked like a field we'd, we'd take spray paint and, and, and do the lines we ordered professional bases and put them down and we'd get out there and you know what everybody do we'd all line up you know what I'm talking about line up pick teams my brother was always a captain because he was the uh, oldest and the next oldest guy he would pick. His name was Donnie Calsard. My brother's name was Donnie Smith. And, and, and they, you ever do cap, you know, throw the bat up in the air and you do this? Anybody do that? That's old. Okay. And they put their hand and they, whoever got to the top of the bat, they put their hand on that. Got it? Okay. It's okay. So then what would happen is like Donnie Kouser would get it, okay? So I'm going to pretend like you're me, okay, preacher? And this, this is all playing ball here, got it? And, and Donnie Kouser would do this. He'd go, he'd win. He'd go, my brother's old pick. He'd go, mm -hmm. I tell you. And I'd go, what does that mean? And then my brother, I'm surely he's going to pick me. And my brother would go, And he'd get down to the last two guys. And Donnie Couch would go, mm. I'll take her. You, you get him. <laughs> now, you, when, you, when, when you find out you were gotten, 
not picked, are chosen. You know you're not wanted. And my brother would say, uh, Marvin, go way out in right field. I said, there's a guy out there. Go way past him. <laughs> and then he'd go, uh, our first baseman doesn't have a glove. Let me have your glove. I go, tell him go home and get his own glove. Marvin, do you want to play or not? <laughs> That's where it went with me. But folks, in 1964, God went like this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I was, I'm in, folks. Amen? I'm, I'm on the team. God's chosen and appointed us. Say this one. I am a personal witness of Christ. How about this one here? I am God's temple. Folks, it, it changed my life. You know why? Because none of you would respect anybody if they came in here, were smoking in here, or, or, or dancing in here, or drinking in here, or looking at in, inappropriate material. Am I right? Why? Because we're in the church house. This is not the church house, really. is you're the church house. And when I saw that, I'm the temple. This is where the Shekinah glory lives. In the temple? It helped, it purified me. How about this one here? Say it. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. How about this one here? Go. I am God's co-worker. This is important. See, I didn't understand why God called me preach, preacher. I, went, I didn't read books. I never read books. I went through high school without reading books. My principal, my, after my junior year, called me in his office and he said, Marvin, next year you're going to graduate. I said, well, that's what I wanted to do. He said, no, if you show up or don't show up, you're not coming back after next year. <laughs> so I missed school. I went and got a job. I worked full time. I graduated. Never read a book. So when God called me to preach, I thought, oh, you've really made a mistake. I was 17 and a half years old. But folks, listen to me. Is, is I'm a co-worker with him. So how do I see that? I know I'm a little eccentric on my imagination here. But if you could see a blue ox and he's standing here, he's as tall as the ceiling. A blue ox, got a yoke on him. And the yoke comes over here for another ox. And it's that big. Do you get what I'm doing? I'm, I'm harnessed up with him. And when the master cracks the whip, he starts going. And I'm over here. My feet aren't even touching the ground. I'm just going. <laughs> and I look at him once in a while. I go, wow. We're doing a lot, aren't we? <laughs> and he's over here going, oh, boy. God's using you. Folks, that's how I see my life. <laughs> if I wasn't hooked up to him, I couldn't do anything. But I can do all things through Christ now who strengthens me. How about this? Say it. I may approach God with freedom and confidence. I wish many of you would believe that. It would change your prayer life. And you get up in the morning and go, you know, I have audience with the Holy God. How about this? Go ahead. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Quit saying you can't do stuff. Quit saying that. If you're in Christ and he wants you to do it, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Say this one here. Ready? I am God's workmanship. The word workmanship is where we get our word poem, poetic work. You are a poetic work of God. That's what you are. You're a poetic work of God. Your life rhymes to God. When he looks at you, it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful poem to him. Say that. I am more than a conqueror. Now, folks, listen. You know what that means? More than a conqueror? Can, can I borrow you again, brother? Will you come here a second? Now, stand here next to me, okay? <laughs> okay. Now, obviously, if him and I got in a fight, I'd win. <laughs> no, why are you laughing? You don't know. You know. This coat hides, I wear a coat because it hides a lot. Okay? 
No, you obviously he'd win. That means he would con conquer me. Is that right? Yeah, that's right? He didn't call you conquerors. What did he call you? More, more than a conqueror. So there's something more, something greater than conquering somebody in this thing. Sure. You can sit down. I'll meet you in the parking lot later. <laughs> Bring your wife. You'll need her. Now look, you know what's so beautiful? Is what that means, more than conquer, means no matter what comes down the pike of life. It's already been won in Jesus Christ. I've had some battles lately. I mean, some battles. And I had to remind myself, I am more than a conquer preacher. I had to reel my emotions in with these truths that I'm giving you to save my life from the enemy, the one that was the one to devour me. Yeah. Say this one last time. Here we go. And you know, everybody do it now. Here we go. The more you reaffirm who you are in Christ, the more your behavior to reflect your true identity. Let's pray together, okay? You've been so good to preach to tonight. Thank you. But how many of us right now would say, Pastor, I have believed lie after lie after lie. It has held me in some bondage. It has hindered me. It's almost like it's, there are times it paralyzes me from being able to reach my potential. Well, here's what I want you to do tonight. Listen, let's start off right. Will you do this? Will you go to the altar tonight and say, God, I'm going to believe what you say about me, about others, and about yourself instead of what the devil's been telling me about me and others and about you, God? You say, preacher, God help me tonight. Would you immediately get up as the piano begins? Just get up right now and come and kneel and thank God for what he's taught you tonight. Just get up. And do that business right now. That's right. Don't wait. Do it right now. You come right now. If you're here tonight and you would say this, listen carefully. Pastor, I would like to know Christ, the Christ you spoke of. I don't think I'm saved. I'm interested in Christ, but I've never had that born again experience. Well, God loves you. Christ died for you. And he wants you to be in him. He wants to make you everything that we just said that we are in Christ. And you'd say, preacher, I've never had that, but pray for me. Slip your hand up right there. I'll be praying for you. Just slip it up high and then back down. Just up and then back down. You say, preacher, I need to be saved. 
I want my sins forgiven. When I die, I want to go to heaven. And I'd like for Christ to live in and through my life right now. Slip your hand up and I'll be praying for you to slip it up high, back down. Please let me do that, okay? Anyone? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this good time together. And I, I like to make this session right here an encouragement, a very exhorting time. Because when it got in me, way back in 1978, we began, Alice and I began to rehearse these things in our lives. And it has just helped us out so much. And in the dark moments of life, when the lies seem to be overwhelming, just to know the truth. Because the truth is what makes us free. So I ask you, God, to help us tonight not to ever forget these truths. And when the enemy lies, maybe we resist the lies of Satan. When he tells us you can't do that, help us to go, I, I can do all things to Christ. When the devil says you can't have the victory, help us to say, we, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When the devil tells us that God doesn't love you, help us, God, just to say back to him, that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Help us, God, tonight to be victorious warriors instead of defeated victims. By doing what? By taking the sword of the Spirit and combating the lies. Now unto him that's able to keep us from falling and one day present us totally faultless before his throne. We bring glory to you tonight and thank you for letting me be here at this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Preacher. On behalf of Cornerstone Baptist Church, thank you for visiting us today. If you're a first time visitor, if you would go to the website, finley.church visitor and fill out a visitor's card and let us get some information about our church to you. If you made a decision today for Christ, again, go to the website, finley.church decision, and we're gonna send you a book called Done by Carrie Schmidt. It's just a book that gives you next steps in your walk with Christ. If you're watching us on YouTube, if you would subscribe to it, what that does, it gets the message of the gospel outside of these four walls around the world. If you watch us on Facebook, if you would just like us, again, it does the same thing. And again, thank you for visiting with us. But the most important decision that you can make is a decision for Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more about how to go to heaven, give us a call. Our phone number is 419-420-8222. Call us right away. I'd like to personally talk with you and, and, and help you to know what it is to have peace in Jesus Christ and know that when you leave this world, you're going to heaven. Th again, thank you for coming. Visit us soon.